I've had a lot of requests to talk about the best and worst laptops of 2018. So let's go through some different categories and find out which models were winners and losers. Twenty eighteen saw Intel put out their eighth gen mobile CPUs, going up to six cores in the i7 8750H, i7 8850H, and i9 8950H K. While these CPUs were a nice step up in performance compared to the seventh gen mobile chips, heat has been a major problem. A common trend in twenty eighteen was that these CPUs are often stuffed into laptops with inadequate cooling requiring power limitations, resulting in lower performance than what they could otherwise achieve in sustained multi-core workloads. I guess we'll have to wait and see if this changes at all with the 9th gen in 2019. As for graphics, we still had the 10 series from Nvidia, with the 1060 being a great sweet spot for 1080p 60fps gaming with most games even at high settings, the 1050 Ti being a great mid-range option, and the 1070 and above being excellent for higher 120Hz or 144Hz refresh rate displays with AAA games. This has been the case for the last couple of years now, although the rumour is we'll be hearing more about new laptop graphics cards at CES in January, so make sure you're subscribed for my CES coverage in a couple of weeks. A few AMD and Radeon laptops also appeared too. Over the entire year I was only able to get my hands on one, the Acer Nitro 5. I'm not sure why review units are so hard to come by. Hopefully there will be more for me to try out in 2019. With that quick recap out of the way, I'm only going to be talking about laptops that I've covered on the channel and have personal experience with. There are plenty of other laptops out there, but without actually using them I can't really comment too much. Let's start with some of the best laptops of the year, keeping in mind that these are just my personal opinions based on my own experience. Everyone has different needs and preferences. Let me know in the comments what you'd pick for each category and why. For best value, my go-to laptops have generally been the Dell G5 or Acer Helios 300 earlier on in this year, as you get pretty good specs for the money, especially with sales, around $1000 with GTX 1060 graphics. I think I've got to give the win to Walmart's OP gaming laptop though. And while I haven't used their specific configuration, I have reviewed the Apex 15 from Aftershock, which uses the same Tongfang chassis. Overall, it was quite a nice machine, and with the price cuts that Walmart has introduced, it appears to be a great option if you're in the US. Other laptops would include the Acer Nitro 5, which offers pretty good performance for the money. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get my hands on too many cheaper options this year. In 2018 there were quite a few thin gaming laptops that still packed high end specs, like the i7 8750H with 1070 graphics and 144Hz screens, but thinner with good specs generally means higher prices, so they're not for everyone, and of course heat management will be a challenge. Some examples would be the Razer Blade, Asus Zephyrus M and S, the MSI GS65, and maybe even the Aero 15X although that is perhaps just a touch larger than the others. All are pretty good machines. The GS65 and Zephyrus S are usually the cheapest and should offer similar features and performance compared to the others. So in terms of value for a thin and light well specced gaming laptop they're both good choices. Upgrading the GS65 is unfortunately a bit more involved though as the motherboard is reversed and the body is a bit flexible if you push down on it, but perfectly fine during normal usage though. In my opinion, the Zephyrus S is a bit nicer. If you've got the money though, the Razer Blade is the best in my opinion. The design looks great, the touchpad is excellent, and it lasts for quite some time with its larger battery. In terms of cooling design though, the unique design of the Zephyrus models also deserve a shout out, as I found this to actually do a pretty good job of keeping the components cool. There were a number of other thin laptops that didn't quite have gaming specs but were still very nice to use. A shout out to the Dell XPS 13 which was a nice machine in this super portable size, and the Razer Blade Stealth which I'm reviewing at the moment. I've mentioned that heat management has been one of the major issues plaguing the 8th gen Intel laptops, but which actually do a good job at keeping things cool. In terms of the thinner models, the Asus Zephyrus performed well with its lift up design 
but I've got to give this one to the Acer Helios 500. Yes, it's a 17 inch laptop and is fairly thick, but it uses this space well in terms of cooling, unlike many others. It can get fairly warm at stock, but when you boost the fan speeds, temperatures are able to drop down by around 20 degrees Celsius, thanks to the thick heat sinks in the corners, allowing it to get some of the best temperatures with the i7 8750H I've seen. I've been trying to get my hands on the 8 core Ryzen model to do a comparison, but no luck on that so far. To me, a good video editing laptop only has a few requirements. A CPU with high clock speeds for the editing process, more CPU cores and discrete graphics for exporting, an SD card slot for offloading video from my camera, and a decent looking screen. If you've been following the channel, you may know I recently got the Gigabyte Aero 15X to use for this purpose. And after all of the laptops I've used, it's still number one for me in this category. I suspect the Dell XPS 15 may have given it a good run for its money, but I haven't been able to get one of those for testing. I recently upgraded the Aero, so it's all ready for my upcoming CES trip, where it'll be put to the test. For best battery life, there are two main contenders that immediately come to mind. The Gigabyte Aero 15X and the Razer Blade. Both laptops that I tested had the Intel i7-8750H CPU and Nvidia GTX 1070 Max-Q graphics, so quite powerful specs. But thanks to the ability of swapping over to the Intel graphics outside of gaming, their large batteries allowed them to last the longest out of all laptops I've ever tested. The Razer Blade Stealth that I'm currently in the process of reviewing did actually last longer, in the just watching YouTube test, but it is a much lower spec device. I suspect there would have been a few other great laptops for this category, such as the MacBook Pro, but unfortunately I didn't get the chance to test those out in 2018. I still haven't used that many 2-in-1 laptops, but the Dell XPS 15 2-in-1 was easily the best I've used so far. Not only are the specs pretty nice, with the Intel CPU and Radeon GPU combination, but the whole machine just feels extremely premium. The hinge mechanism is sturdy and the screen looks excellent. It actually made me consider getting a 2-in-1 just for watching YouTube videos on the couch, but 15 inches for a tablet device is a bit large for me, otherwise a great machine. Other than these categories, in general it's been nice to see thin bezel laptops become more popular in 2018. While I hope this trend continues as I think it looks nice, it does mean that the overall size of the laptop needs to be smaller too, which may negatively affect things such as cooling capacity and upgradability. Now let's check out the worst laptops of 2018. There's actually not as many as I thought there would be, and most of them only have one major downside, rather than being all round bad choices. The worst laptop, and probably the only one I used this year that I'm unable to recommend would be the ASUS FX504. I went into testing it hoping that it would be a great value for money machine, but there were some pretty bad performance issues. In my review, I noted that there was stuttering in various games due to power limit throttling, although a lot of people mentioned that this issue has since been fixed by a newer BIOS update so at least it's been improved. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to retest this myself, as the laptop went back to ASUS after the review. Either way, that's not the major issue I had with it. The worst problem was that while under a combined graphical and CPU workload, the i7-8750H appeared to be capped to a 25 watt TDP. Normally we'd want this to be at 45 watts. I haven't tested the i5-8300H model myself, but some of you mentioned in the comments that it had similar limits. This seems to be for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it had a small 120 watt power brick. I've tested a similarly specced laptop with a 120 watt power brick before, and with a 45 watt limit, I found that every few seconds the screen would dim and FPS would dip, as it would only be running on battery power because it wasn't receiving enough from the wall. So I'm pretty sure the power brick just isn't adequate for the hardware for them to increase the power limit further in a future BIOS update. The second reason is that the heat pipes inside are honestly just pathetic for a 6 core 8750H laptop. Granted the thermals in my testing were actually fairly cool, but this was just a result of the kneecapped power limit. It's another reason I doubt this can be improved in the future, as there just isn't enough cooling capacity available to support a higher power limit. ASUS have redeemed this in the newer FX505, 
Not only does it look nicer overall with slim bezels, but the CPU TDP limit is 45 watts, with bigger heat pipes available and a 180 watt power brick. So a better cooling solution and more power which results in better performance from the same CPU. The next laptop is the Dell G7 with i9-8950HK CPU. Don't get me wrong, the G7 is a good laptop overall. Although if you caught my G5 vs G7 video, you can usually get the G5 for less money and it's basically the same. The issue isn't actually with the G7, but more to do with the i9 CPU being available in certain laptops. As I noted in the G7 review, I was seeing very similar performance to the G5 with the i7-8750H. Although the i9 can technically be overclocked, in my testing overclocking was never actually useful for sustained multi-core load. This was due to power limit throttling. I wasn't able to achieve higher power limits after boosting the TDP. Even undervolting the CPU didn't allow me to reach the stock 3.9GHz of the 8750H while under CPU stress test let alone the 4.3GHz all-core turbo speed of the i9. The overclock will be more useful in less core-heavy workloads, such as single-threaded applications for example. But I think if you're paying the $600 Australian dollar extra to go from i7 to i9, in the case of the G7, then I'd want a better result than this. Even if power limits get further increased in a BIOS update, the temperatures were already close to 90 degrees Celsius so I doubt we'd see much gain before thermal throttling became the next issue. But again, these temperatures are common across all Intel 8th gen laptops. That's not unique to the G7 at all. I'm sure Dell aren't the only ones doing this. Apple had a similar situation where they crammed the i9 into their even thinner MacBook Pro, and I'd expect something similar there. I think the only laptop I had great success with the i9 was the MSI GT75 Titan. I was able to overclock all 6 cores to around 4.9GHz, and have the CPU running with a 100W TDP. Pretty crazy, but I think that's what you need if you want to properly take advantage of the i9 in a laptop. That's it, my best and worst laptop picks for 2018. Again, these are just my personal opinions after reviewing laptops throughout the year. Let me know down in the comments what you'd have picked instead for each category and why. Also let me know if you found this sort of video useful. Would you want to see a similar video at the end of 2019? This is the last video that will go up on the channel for 2018. Thanks everyone for the support over that time and I look forward to making more videos in 2019. In particular, we should be getting 9th gen Intel laptops and new Nvidia graphics. Hopefully I can get more AMD stuff too. I'm going to be posting more behind the scenes stuff to Facebook and Twitter as well. So if you haven't already, you can like and follow there to keep up to date with what I'm working on. Links to both can be found in the description. And as always, if you're new here, don't forget to subscribe for future tech videos in 2019.